Another Way Erasmus Plus Program Cooperation for Innovation and the Exchange of Good Practices KA205 Strategic Partnership for IAF Funded by EU Number 2019-2-IT 03-KA205-016466 Co-funded by the Erasmus Plus Program of the European Union Mediterranea Associazione per lo sviluppo locale This work is licensed under the Creative Commons Attribution Non-Commercial Share Alike 4.0 International License. To view a copy of this license, visit http colon slash slash creativecommons.org or send a letter to Creative Commons P.O. Box 1866 Mountain View CA 94042 USA Per altra via Another way An original method by Francesco Piccolo Module 2 Hosts Lessons 1 and 2 Tourism In the previous module, we defined the subject of the sentence that constitutes our training. Who hosts through another way. The subject is us intended as people with needs and feelings. We are the bearers of an individual and collective culture and memory. It is us with our language. It is us who perceive the reality that surrounds us and live our lives together with others. It is us as an individual or person, but also as people or communities. To be more precise in our analysis, even the recipients of our action have similar characteristics to ours. In fact, they are people too. But let us proceed calmly and dual on the action preached by the verb to host. This verb means to serve as a host, originally in the sense give entertainment, receive as a guest, and comes from the host word derived from the Latin hospes, which indicates both the stranger who is lodged and the one who lodges the stranger. There is therefore reciprocity of rights and duties between the host and the guest. 
However, it has been since the 11th century AD that the word Oste, first in Italy, Oste, and France, Host, and then in the rest of Europe, indicates the person who is accommodated in return for payment. The verb to host, therefore, designates a precise action. The receiving at one's home, by extension community, region, city, the foreigner, the stranger. In our training, it is used in the third person, which suggests that the person who performs this action is not just anybody, but a precise subject. It is the host through another way. I am talking about you with you. That is why it is important that you follow me in what I am about to say. As participants in this course, you are called to welcome and make possible the reception of the foreigner, the stranger, the tourist. But who is the tourist? A foreigner, a stranger, or a voyager? To answer the question, it is necessary to analyze the events that have determined the emergence of tourism first as a social phenomenon, then as an economic one. Until today it has become an object of study and academic research. The humankind has always traveled. The need for survival, first of all, famine, earthquakes, floods, but later also wars and deportations. The first great Epic poem tells of the return journey of a hero, Ulysses, to his homeland, Ithaca. Over time, however, he also traveled for religious reasons, great events and celebrations. Think for example, of the great games of Olympia, which gathered Greeks from all polis and for which conflicts also ceased. The Jews frequently went to the Temple of Jerusalem according to tradition. The Romans used to have magnificent villas for their ferie, our holidays.
and the same Christmas tale, in the end, is the story of a birth that happens during a journey started for a census, but then it becomes an escape when three wise men arrive from afar following a star and announce a persecution. There is no doubt that the man is a traveler. So is he also a tourist? Let's go farther to understand. In the Middle Age, the figure of the traveler takes on the identity of a pilgrim. It is the man who sets out on a journey animated by a deep religious feeling or to fulfill a prescription of his creed. Thus were born the path to Santiago de Compostela and that bundle of ways that from several parts of Northern Europe converge in Italy to go to Rome to the tomb of Saint Peter or to reach the mountain of the Archangel Michael or to go to Jerusalem starting from Apulia Finibus Terre the end of the land On the trajectories of these roads are still located the main European cities, the centers of great commercial exchange of the past, cultural centers of such great importance that they are now altogether involved to candidate the Via Francigena as a UNESCO World Heritage Site. But pilgrims are not only Christians. The Islamic religion also includes pilgrimages to Mecca, Medina and Jerusalem. At the beginning of the 14th century, manuscripts appeared telling of the long journey of a Venetian merchant, Marco Polo, to the distant lands of the East. The original title is Le Livre de Marco Polo, citoyen de Venise, di Millon, ou l'encan les merveilles du monde. The book of Marco Polo, citizen of Venice, called Milione, where the wonders of the world are told. You also travel for commerce, as Million says, but you begin to appreciate what travel offers, meeting new cultures. Later, 
the objectives of travel become more and more varied to discover and conquer new lands and from the Renaissance on also to evangelize that is to spread impose Catholicism or more generally Christianity where it is not yet practiced from 1492 in fact roots moved from east to west and travel became synonymous with conquest in any case however the means available are feed livestock ships but from 1700 things began to change more and more the desire to travel not for a precise purpose but with the sole purpose of visiting a place other than the one where you live it is a desire that few can afford we know that usually the needs ask to be satisfied from the most basic to the highest so only the nobles or the rich bourgeois feel this need to escape from the, their habitat to know other places different ancient cultures or completely unknown to them it was born in England one of the most extensive empires and despite all the less European the Grand Tour the expression Grand Tour appeared for the first time in Richard Lessel's guide The Voyage of Italy published in 1670 later Thomas Coriat in his Coriat's Crudities makes it an exclusive event in which young English and European aristocrats want to participate. At the same time, as this practice is becoming established, there is the visit to the museum, a place where it is possible to make mental and emotional journeys. The first public museums were established in this period. The Uffizi Gallery, donated to the people of Florence by Anna Maria Luisa de' Medici in 1737 and the British Museum in London 1753 also in Italy the Capitoline Museums and the Pio Clementino Museum in Rome were inaugurated
The French Revolution strongly and violently affirmed the idea that all men are equal, without any distinction of senses or class. One of the rights of man is precisely to enjoy the masterpieces of art and every other rarity and beauty. The collections of the French crown and the aristocracy are therefore confiscated and declared property of the people. The modern museum is born. In 1793, in Paris, in what was the city residence of the King of France, opened the Louvre Museum. A visit to the city museum allows the nascent bourgeoisie to escape from everyday reality and make those journeys, those encounters with cultures far away in time and space, which are still the prerogative of a few. Goethe, Italienische Reise, 1816-1817, and Stendhal, Memoir d'un Touriste, 1838, are among the most illustrious artists who will come to Italy on the Grand Tour with the sole purpose of learning about Italian and European culture, history and art. Their experience will write pages of literature, making their experience of art a work of art. Artists privileged, rich and spoiled young people, the first tourist in history? Yes, I say strongly. It is these young people who have everything, but still feel empty, curious, to know what is beyond the door, driven by the desire to establish themselves in society as men who know the world, the first tourist. Or at least it is to them that I refer to talking about tourism in another way. In this sense, I believe that the successive discriminations that want to distinguish the voyager from the tourist are distortions that make sense only if the concept of tourism that you have in mind is as far from the original one, from what we will face later. These distortions are completely justified if we analyze what has been 
happening since the second half of the 19th century. The invention of the steam engine, the industrial revolution, motor ships, steam ships, and above all, the advent of the train and the railway irreversibly changed the very concept of travel and therefore of tourism. On the 5th July 1841, the first tour of history took place in England. At the cost of a shilling, 570 people travel by train from Leicester to Loughborough, 11 miles, where they will eat the meal included in the price. Their tour operator the first in history is Thomas Cook, an English entrepreneur who founded the first travel agency, Thomas Cook and Son. We can safely say that Cook invented modern tourism. Three years later, in fact, the Midland Counties Railway Company agrees to make the agreement permanent if Cook continues to provide passenger for the excursion trains. During the 1855 Paris Exhibition in Paris, Cook conducted excursions from Leicester to Calais, France. The following year, he conducted his first grand tour of Europe. In 18 Seventy-three, Jules Verne published Le Tour du Monde en quatre-vingt jours. We can understand why the author chose Phileas Fogg, a rich Englishman who decided to do the world tour from London in 80 days. The novel is compelling and gives great emotions related to adventure and exploration, chance encounters and cultural clashes. The short century 1900 seems to stop the phenomenon of tourism, or rather, it delimits it to a form that is that of domestic tourism. With the end of the Second World War, tourism became a mass phenomenon and was structured as a real industry, with the worst consequences of industrialization and massification. In the meantime, however, the time has become ripe 
to open a debate on tourism, on its essence, on the correct way to do tourism. A lively and open debate in continuous evolution and into which and into which and into which we need to enter because that's what another way is about tourism another way was not born as a voluntary activity or with a philanthropic mission. I have thought of a method that allows people with visual disabilities but also sighted people to use tourist services, in particular guided tours in the city or other contexts where it is possible to make a tour with specific characteristics that we will see later. This in no way means that there is no place for an ethical vision, but on the contrary, that an ethical vision of tourism, understood as an encounter between cultures, is inherent in the method itself, and this, in fact, annuls the demarcation that others see between the voyager and the tourist, attributing to the latter a note of superficiality and vulgarity that, in my opinion, in its profound nature, does not have. If we want to simplify by borrowing from the economic sector, the combination of supply and demand, we should say that the tourist is vulgar, disrespectful, when supply is vulgar and disrespectful. For this reason, I believe that to build a tour it is necessary to have clear ideas about who does what. Who are the operators? With what purpose do they realize and promote the tool? Through what strategies? Who do they involve in this social and also economically process now is the time to clear up any misunderstandings it is correct to think that an AW operator can earn money from his work Making an AW tour requires time, dedication, creativity. Like many other jobs, it has social consequences. But ask yourself if the operators of the many philanthropic foundations work for free. We offer a service and it is right to get paid for it. The difference is 
in the way we work, in the commitment we put into it, and in the main purpose which is not profit, understood as profit maximization, but favoring the encounter of the other, the tourist with the territory of which he is a guest. Rates should not be increased because they are aimed at a small audience but calibrated according to objective criteria that relate to the cost of materials, for example, or other items of which it is premature to speak now. For us, host of AW, the tourist is not a foreigner, but a traveler a guest of our land, land that we respect and love, and that we are proud to present to our tourist, to let him go away from us, changed deep down. I close this reflection on tourism and the verb host with the words of those who for me represent the ideal tourist, the one to whom I would like to offer my services. His words have inspired me to look for a way, a way, a method to make accessible to many what seems to be destined to a single party. These are the words of Mary Harry Bailey called Stendhal. Absorbed in the contemplation of sublime beauty, I saw her close up touched her as it were. I had reached that level of emotion where one encounters the heavenly sensations given by the hearts and passionate feelings. Leaving Santa Croce, I had a plunge to the hurt. Life had dried up for me. I walked fearing to fall. Standal, Rome, Naples, Florence. I travelled in Italy from Milan to Reggio Calabria. In this lesson, the images are used for educational purposes only, and for the most part are original. Those for which it has been possible to identify the source are mentioned in the image itself. For the others, the author remains available to give credit to any rights holder who requests it using the following address peraltravia at gmail.com